welcome to the Nate KG Podcast, a show dedicated to exploring the nuances of jump rope, where I talk with jump ropers of all skill levels, backgrounds, and fitness goals. In this episode, I have a chat with Dustin Glass at Dustin L. Glass on Instagram. This is a bit of a powerhouse episode as Dustin and I discussed a huge variety of topics. You'll soon find out that Dustin is a super humble and hilarious guy, and though not all of our stories are directly jump rope related, they all do tie into his jump rope and fitness journey. We chat about maintaining motivation when you hit skill blocks, who should be creating jump rope tutorials, restructuring training to keep it fun, and how to minimize cognitive load to maximize your fitness goals. All of the show notes for this episode can be found over at natekg.com. And now, please enjoy my conversation with Dustin Glass. Dustin, thank you for being on the show, man. Dude, no problem. I'm, I'm actually honored. I'm still, I'm still surprised you hit me up, but uh, this is a great opportunity, man. No, for sure. I mean, that's what, you know, this whole show is really about highlighting everyone in the community. So, and we, you and I have been able to jump together and you got you bring a lot of energy and charisma to the group, man. So I, I had to have you on. Thanks, dude. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Let's get started with um, you know a little bit of context about where you are in the world, and then how you first pit or when you first picked up a jump rope and why. Yeah, totally. So I uh, I live in Los Angeles in California. Um, in for those who know the geography, I live in uh, Echo Park on the east side of LA, Sweet, and, yeah. and I say that. I say that very tactfully because, you know, there are some people who prefer to be near the beach. I've always been near the beach, actually. But in L.A., uh, the east side is a bit more a little more bohemian, you know, a little more hipster. Um, you know, obviously, if we weren't in the middle of the pandemic, I'd be able to hit up all the coffee shops, concert <laughs> venues. But uh, all that said, yeah, I'm on the east side of L.A. Um, like we were talking about before the podcast, I, I work in, in advertising, but specifically with influencers uh, and influencer marketing. And so that job is, again, very Los Angeles, but uh, I enjoy doing that. And that's typically on the west side is where my office is. And then I guess to a more important question, I picked up a jump rope seriously about, I want to say it was about three years ago now. Um, I was pretty heavy at the time. I think uh, nearing the heaviest I'd ever been, like 285 pounds, roughly 295 maybe. And I had actually just started hitting a bag again. So I'd you know done martial arts as a kid, and I started hitting the bag around three years ago, and and I sort of got a jump rope as a sort of as a companion to that um, to start skipping again, and then I really found myself being more in love with the jump rope than the boxing again, and so I kind of it, the percentage switched. So I started doing like you know eighty percent boxing, twenty percent skipping, uh, and then it kind of flipped and when I got really into the community and. I started following Rush's videos. I started looking at, you know, the JRD guys um, and got really into the social side. And then, yeah, it just kind of fell in place from there, man. I've been I've been jumping rope ever since. OK, so I've got a couple follow up questions for you before we keep going with the jump rope stuff. When we were talking beforehand, you made a comment that you're more on the introverted side. But when we're not in a pandemic, you go around and you go visit visit coffee shops and go to concerts and stuff. <laughs> I had to call uh, you out on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I will say this, man. I'm definitely an extroverted introvert. I guess what I, I'm not an introvert. That's actually BS. I feel <laughs> like I'll say this though, man, is I think when I said that I, I just, I suppose I'm not really into the, the party scene, um, of LA anymore. You know, I, I don't, I I, the club yeah. scene, the party scene, but dude, I love music. I love film. So I guess if I, I do go out, but when I go out, it tends to be more of those subdued kind of activities. You know, I want to go to a coffee shop or a brewery, talk to my friends, but, you know, or go to a show. Right. Well, like you said, the hipster thing of like you're expending energy and having fun, but not too much energy because that wouldn't be hipster. Right. It wouldn't be hipster. dude. <laughs> it, would, it would be so bro that <laughs> it would cancel out any hipster uh, mentality. Yes. But um, yeah, I think in the. You know, when I'm not training, you know, my gym, which, again, is closed right now, or I'm not um, working, you know, I'm usually at home, man. So it's I kind of look at myself as a bit of a an introvert in that way. But I guess you're right. It is BS. I do. Lo I love people, man. I love building relationships, but I just don't like the club thing. I don't mm -hmm. like you know the partying thing. Do you do you like being home and chilling out and having like quiet time? Because I've talked about this a lot with. Davina actually and we've we've 
talked about, I think on the podcast and just, you know, privately, like for, for me, like I do consider myself, like you said, an extroverted introvert, which is that I really need and require my solitude. But then there are times where I can go do extroverted things for a given period of time, but then I then need to recharge and chill out. Do you, do you find yourself to be the same way? Yeah, dude, that's, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I think it, uh, it also has a lot to do with, you know, I, I was a sort of a literature major in college, not mm-hmm. sort of, I was a literature major. I studied, <laughs> studied creative writing. I got the uh, degree, but like, you know, yeah. it was, it was kind of half and half. <laughs> I still feel guilty that I got to study that in college. You know, I don't know. While other people were learning to be engineers and doctors, um, all I did was read books, but um, on a serious note, man, I think that does have a, it affects my disposition. You know, like I like being at home with a book. I like being at home, getting that recharge time. But again, the second, you know, my buddy Joe calls me, you know, we're on the phone wrapping it up for two hours. So yeah. I, I feel like you and I are very similar in that regard. Yeah. That's actually the piece that I pulled from that. When you said your buddy calls you and you, you guys talk for two hours, I literally cannot have a conversation for less than one or two hours at a time on the phone with someone, unless there is an external factor that forces us to get off the phone. So I feel that actually. Yeah, totally. Okay. So back to the jump rope stuff. (laughs) I just wanted to to talk about that for a second, but back to the jump rope stuff. So what, how many years have you been jumping now? Again, including, including like with martial arts and boxing and stuff like the very beginning. I mean, I guess, yeah. I mean, if we're going back to like the first time I picked up a jump rope, it it would certainly go back to like grade school. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? But Mm -hmm. I feel like there were many years um, between when I did, you know, martial arts and boxing as like a kid and, you know, like three years ago when I started jumping seriously. So Mm -hmm. I want to say, you know, I'd be, you know, yeah, I've been jumping for 20 years, but that's, you know, in reality, it's right. Jumped a bit like any casual kid maybe would uh, in the playground, but really started seriously jumping um, and skipping like a few years ago again. Okay. And so yeah. then w- when you started, like you were saying, you were doing just kind of using it as a tool for martial arts and boxing primarily, and then picking up a few skills. What what did those workouts look like when you first started? Because I kind of want to go through go through your progression here because where you are now is very impressive and you've made very serious gains over the past couple of years, even from last year at the, at the LA workshop. But when you first began, what did those workouts look like and how were you using the jump rope? Oh dude, it's so funny you asked this question too, because I was just looking at, um, you know, cause I'm a fan of the Instagram as I feel a lot of us are in this oh, yeah. community, uh, the IG I was looking at some like archive stories or like videos I shot from a few years ago. I was at my gym uh, at Barbell Brigade downtown and I guess the workouts I was doing, man, it was like, you know, I, I was really heavy at that point. You know, I'm still pretty, I'm a big guy relative to to a lot of jumpers in the community, but dude, I, the workouts would consist of me just, you know, I think at the time I was using this really cheap rogue, um, sorry, you can cut that out (laughs) really cheap. (laughs) non-branded jump rope <laughs> that was wired That's definitely staying in oh. <laughs> it was certainly not an rx smart gear rope i'll tell you that uh, it was it was some other brand it was super cheap man but it was like i i the workout would would consist of me just trying to figure out how to rotate the rope for you know 45 minutes at a time but i would do it you know i would ju- it would just be a basic bounce jump um and i would just go for you know, probably 20 seconds at a time until I could figure out the rotation. That was like where it started, you know, because I, mm-hmm. I didn't even have the basic fundamental down, you know, after years of not jumping rope, it, it would just be me trying to figure out again, the the rhythm uh, and bounce of jumping. And I wasn't really using a rope with great feedback. So as you know, and this is something you have even taught me before, it's like, it's, it can be really tough for a beginner using like a wired rope uh, to Absolutely. just figure out the basic movement. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but that honestly, that's where the workout started. Yep. So you were literally just trying to get, literally get your feet and get your foundation. That makes sense. Yeah. Straight up. What, you know, what kept you going through that? Because for a lot of people, I mean, it's obviously frustrating, but that frustration can be so tremendous. What, what kept you pushing through that? Dude, I think it would be, and I guess I'd relate this to fitness in general with the other training I do, but I, I did notice progression, you know, week to week. And that really, that that's that kind of high that kept me going. But also, man, I, I can't lie, you know, I, I work in influencer marketing, so social media is a big part of my life, but I also enjoy the community. And, and really, this community, 
you know, I started randomly following folks like you and Deck um, and Chris and other people who were just tagging each other. And uh, I kind of fell into the community that way. So like watching, it literally was Deck, dude. I hate, I, I not hate to say it, I love to say it, but I would watch him even do crossovers or do his robot machine workout with just running in place, jump roping. I'm like, this yeah. dude is like, how does this guy do that? You know, like, I don't understand how he's so quick. And so it was really inspirational. And based on the the vibes of the community, you know, you have these people who I'd look at being like, I don't understand how that's possible with a rope, but then DM them or comment and then and then start a conversation. So it was it was very heartening uh, and inspiring to see people in the community who I thought were like superheroes with a jump rope to like, you know, have an exchange with them and, and bounce ideas off them. And that really kept me going um, in addition to like noticing improvement week to week. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That can it seems like connection, uh, connection in the form of like f fulfilling relationships is really important. I want to go back to your work stuff real quick and talk about your profession for a second because oh, yeah. we were talking a little bit before this and now I'm kind of kicking myself for not having recorded it, but I want to talk about your work and we, because we were chatting about meeting folks that have high follower counts, whether that's YouTube, Instagram, whatever. And can, so can you tell me, I, I kind of want you to explain what we were chatting about. Yeah. Can you tell me about what your work is specifically and kind of what you, what you've learned, um, meeting the, the folks that you've met? Yeah, absolutely. So again, I work in influencer marketing for a, a, what we call a creative agency. So for those who aren't familiar with like the marketing world or the advertising world, brands come to an agency just like a, an actor would, right? To help, you know, help do things, I guess, is the simplest way to put it. So if a massive brand doesn't understand how to market their product, they'll appeal to a creative agency to help design a strategy for marketing a product or an initiative. Uh, I work on the agency side and our clients are those brands. But we we specifically help tailor campaigns targeted around influencers. So that's YouTubers, TikTokers, Instagrammers. Um, I help design the strategy for those brands but mainly focus on the talent portion. So my whole career, you know, over the past five years has really um, revolved in a big way around developing relationships with, with big YouTube celebrities, um, big digital creators on Instagram in order to help um, bring them into the fold in an advertising campaign and create content for my brand clients. So, you know, obviously you rub shoulders with um, with smaller creators, developing creators, and you also rub shoulders with some of the biggest YouTubers in the world. And what we were talking about before is like, you know, the relationships I've built with some of these people, I now consider true friends, um, where other, you know, whereas other ones tend to be a little more, bit more vapid and a little bit more like Hollywood LA kind of like, yeah, I know that person and, and that kind of nepotism kind of vibe. Yeah. Um, but one thing that, that you and I were talking about earlier that I really, you know, I, I think we share this quality is that, I tend to focus my energy, even in business, on bringing work to creators that are, um, you know, down to earth, uh, kind people, folks who will do a great job, but also um, they care about relationships just as much as I do. So I guess I, we were kind of discussing that, but, you know, feel free to fill in the gaps if I'm forgetting something. No, that's exactly it. And it's the reason why I kind of wanted to bring that up is because when we first met, about a year ago at a workshop that Mike Fry and I had hosted in LA, I had, I was going around, I like, for whatever reason, this really sticks out in my memory. I was going around the room and filming everyone to get, you know, Hey, if you want to be on the, on film, I can show you on the YouTube video. It's going to come out in a year from now. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> a year from now? <laughs> yeah. Right. Cause I, well, cause I filmed it then and then I, the goal was to have it done in a month or two. And then it, a year later, I finally posted. <laughs> I, I thought the footage, I thought the footage was lost to oblivion, man. You hit me up and you were like, yeah, man, that vlog's finally coming out. I was like, oh yeah, we did that workshop like 10 years ago. I know, bad. dude. I, I can <laughs> literally am the worst with putting out certain content. I also have a video that I shot with Chris when he was visiting me um, yeah. in San Diego. That's not out yet. But anyway, the point is I'm going around the room and I'm, I'm filming a couple different people and when I come over to you, like you and I had never, like even at that moment, I put a camera in your <laughs> face before I'd even said hi, which like looking back is probably not the best way to introduce yourself to someone. <laughs> um, 
But it was funny because the second that happened and we were talking, it was a very genuine and authentic exchange. And I could tell that like without specifically speaking about it, I could tell your focus about connection or your predisposition towards having a real human connection was there. And so it's interesting now that we're sitting down and, and really talking that there is this massive theme. It seems like everywhere that every in every uh, aspect of your life so far that what we're talking about, that real connection is there. And it sounds that it makes a lot of sense to me why, because that's your focus, you would naturally gravitate towards jump rope or at least the community side of jump rope. Heck yeah, man. I think, um, no, you're absolutely right. I, it's, it's funny cause I try to, you know, I, I have to give credence to like my family and the, the way I was brought up and kind of, um, the experiences I've had that have led to that outlook, you know, mm-hmm. but I think even going back with my, my mom and sort of her, she's, <laughs> she's a pretty lovely woman. This woman, she's like a, a, like a rocker at heart, but also, you know, she found, um, her grounding in like, um, in spiritualism, right? She, she literally, this woman literally goes into houses and cleanses evil spirits. You know, that's my mom, but she's also loves ACDC and bare naked ladies. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, she's, she's a total rocker, man. She's great. Um, and, and sort of her, um, she reared me to, to sort of be that way and to try to keep yourself open to, to real connection and appreciates, you know, relationships, uh, and communities that help, um, you know, fill your heart as opposed to take energy from you. And so that learning that from a young age and my, my father uh, in many ways is the same, my grandparents, the same, but, um, the experiences I've had have all, have all sort of either come from that or I, I lead with that, I guess is how I put it. Like, you know, I, after college, I, I went and worked with teach for America, um, for a while and actually it was in San Diego. Nate, I don't know if we talked about that um, at all, no, we but did. I yeah, I went and taught uh, middle school with Teach for America. And that was, I think, just a function of sort of that kind of same vibe. I was like, I wanted to do something. I wanted to give to a community and kind of foster relationships. But it did end up uh, turning out to be a really difficult experience. Um, but yeah, man, I, I, I think it's all about I think it's all about building connection, fostering those those true relationships, because those are the ones that give back to you. And I I've, I've found that in the strength community. I found that in this jump rope community. And Again, man, the more you give, the more you get back in return. So it feels, yeah, it feels like I found that in in this community for sure. So, man, okay, I have like three follow up questions to that. So this is gonna take a second to get through, but yeah. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good though. I so what was it that was difficult about Teach for America? I would say quite a few things. You know, you um, and again, I think the experience is probably different for a lot of folks, but. I, you know, I just graduated college. I, you have to go through this intense boot camp, you know, at Loyola Marymount. It's sort of your teacher boot camp for three or four weeks. You know, I went and taught uh, at a school in South Central, and that alone is very difficult, right? But it's nothing compared to yeah. to teaching kids for a full day. So you go through this intense training. Lots of folks, you know, leave the program before they get to their actual. Um, location they're going to teach at. But I think, you know, the hardest part is you're a new teacher, you're fresh out of college, you're probably really bright, but you know, teaching kids, man, like they, you can't become a competent educator until you're, you know, maybe your fourth, fifth year, you know, not a master teacher until a decade in, you know, my mother's a teacher as well. Um, and she's been doing it for many years and she's an incredible teacher, but a first year teacher in a low income community, um, also learning to be a more effective ally. You know, I'm a, I'm a white heter- heterosexual cisgendered male, right? And, and you're teaching to an extremely diverse group of students. So you need to be a good ally uh, and do your due diligence um, and support the community as effectively as possible. So it's like all those things, <laughs> you know, combined into mm-hmm. one, one heaping ball of just stress and tears you know, that, that's what made it tough, man. You're teaching kids who are in really, really tough situations. You need to be a better ally. Um, and at the end of the day, you're a new teacher. So being effective is really hard. So um, that was a very roundabout way of saying, you know, teaching kids for a first year when you're a new teacher is is no easy feat. Um, and everything, honestly, that's followed after that, I wouldn't say is a cakewalk, but it's definitely felt a bit easier having had that experience. So, okay. I'm going to ask you first, what, so what did you pull out of that? Were there any big, I mean, we've talked about what the difficulties were and kind of 
you know, yeah. your focus, but what are, what are the lessons or if there are any lessons that you pulled out of that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, you know, bringing it back to our, our core conversation, one thing that I, I really took away from that experience was the quote unquote problems that I have day to day, or maybe most folks have day to day who are in fortunate situations are really not problems, you know? So like it kind of put, it put very much into perspective, um, what I thought were problems. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're just, they're really not, you know? So, um, that was good, right? It gave me perspective, but it also, it also did teach me the value of what, you know, what really mattered. You know, I like, I taught these kids the best I can, uh, and it was extremely hard. I didn't really see the value, but now, you know, even years later, um, the kids I taught are graduating high school, you know, they're DMing me on Instagram, giving me updates on their GPA. So like, I think it also taught me, man, invest in experiences that, that are truly meaningful and like give back. So again, that circles back to sort of helping build community and being a part of community. Um, and also just like, you know what, man, like hard work does pay off. You know, they, the, I guess that, that was sort of a key thing as well. It's funny you say that. Cause I've had a quote, uh, up on a whiteboard for the better part of the last, I guess, three to four years now that says, um, it's the it says it's the experiences you share with meaningful people that builds a fulfilling life. And it's funny that you you literally just articulated that same thing. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. What's the, uh, what's the quote? Is it from anyone in particular? Um, it might be. I literally just wrote it down on the board one day. So it's there's it's highly possible I was reading something and then I just kind of like brain mushed it onto the board, you know, but it, I don't have yeah. like an actual attribution to anyone. But um. So with, okay, so with this perspective that you gained from that, well, so where does the Teach for America fit in terms of your weight loss journey? Oh, dang. That is, man, you're coming up with these great questions, man. Dude, you you're, 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 you're <laughs> do, you know, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Dude, you're showing up with all the fire, uh, the fire story right now. So this is, this is I know. easy. <laughs> I know. Um, no, it's actually, it's great. So I, again, I, I graduated college. I was, I was probably nearing my heaviest again too around that period. So this would have been, I graduated 2013. Um, I was, again, I, my weight has fluctuated quite a bit in my life, but I was definitely really heavy at that point, you know? Um, but I had just gotten into working out with a couple of my fraternity brothers, my senior year. So as I went into teach for America, I already kind of had this fitness bug and it was mainly just bodybuilding training, you know, mm -hmm. classic, kind of bro style training bro in the split. Mm -hmm. yeah bro split straight up um and so i joined the program and i had already kind of been making healthier choices moved down to san diego and as i started my teaching job i i found this gym that was in north park where i lived um and i'm sure it's still there it's called the last real gym um, i'm not even the... surprised to hear you say that you were from north park that is like exactly yeah. where i would imagine you would have landed <laughs> <laughs> Well, I taught in City Heights, San Diego, and it's just across the really across the freeway there from North Park. But yeah, 100 yep. percent. One of my buddies who um, I was a roommate with in sort of our teacher boot camp that I talked about, he and I moved in together. We found a place in North Park, of course. Yes, the most hipster place. Um, but the gym, you know, was was unlike anything I'd seen up until that point. At least it, it was, you know, had had some power lifters in there. And it was this sort of anti-commercial gym, of course, in the most hipster part of North Park, right. the mess like that. But that's when I got into powerlifting, actually. So I, I started training with the folks there, um, powerlifting. And, and really, the, the, because the gym was just a block away, I would walk there early, early in the morning before I had to teach. And somehow, I, I convinced myself that if I could just get up at four thirty, go train for an hour before I had to start my teaching day, that I could like hold it together, you know. And yep. and honestly, when in hindsight, I probably I probably should have scheduled out a little better so I could have been a better teacher. But yeah, man, I, I started training in powerlifting there, and went sort of three to four days a week, um, ended up competing in sort of their local amateur powerlifting competition, and that's kind of actually where I really got serious about fitness in general. So at that time, just, I want to kind of paint a picture oh, yeah. of the context of your weight loss because a, a lot of, so when you're doing powerlifting, is this the period where you were still 
around your heaviest because it's it oh, yeah. like yeah okay so that that yeah, weight yeah. then was a combination of um both muscle and non-muscle yeah at first it was just no muscle at all just straight straight fat is what it felt like for a long time when mm -hmm. i started powerlifting i got the added benefit of some muscle growth but um and my weight fluctuated a bit you know over the year that i was teaching there but yeah i would say i was still pretty heavy um and, and honestly, after my commitment was done, I, you know, I came back to Los Angeles and that's when I started training at Barbell Brigade downtown. You know, a lot of folks know this gym, they have a YouTube presence, but mm -hmm. I, I was still powerlifting. And, you know, that was also when I started my career in entertainment. So I actually, you know, I lost a bit of weight when I first started training there. You know, this is years ago now. I started training at Barbell, still powerlifting for the next couple of years. Um, but, but the weight kind of always really, really fluctuated. Um, and then it wasn't, you know, I, I guess, again, I, I hit a, <laughs> you can see there's highs and lows in this weight loss journey. Uh, I've, I've had a problem with consistency, but I think even, you know, my real most recent weight loss period was in the last, you know, two years, the last year and a half where, you know, I was again at 285, 295, but I, I lost around 55 pounds. Um, and, and so that, I think I attribute a lot of that to, to jump rope. I really do. It was, um, being more, cons it's helped me be more consistent, I guess, is the long and short of it. Okay. So yeah, there's a couple of really important things in there because like you're saying, it's an up and down journey. That to me, yeah. that to me is so important to highlight because that's how it goes. You're, you're, you're not, it's to me, it mm -hmm. seems like there are very, very few case studies or examples of people who start their fitness journey and are, are and are on a linear path forward and yeah. maintain that. I I've, honestly don't think there's ever been a straight linear path because that doesn't that's not how fitness works. But right. it's interesting to hear that once the jump rope hit, that's when your consistency kicked in. What did that again? Trying trying to place things a little bit. The jump rope was that at the powerlifting gym in North Park, or did that start at Barbell Brigade? Oh, that started a barbell. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I, again, I didn't start jumping rope seriously. Yeah, man, I'm old. I feel like this timeline is too long. <laughs> no, you're good. You're like, you just, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, let me paint the narrative. I'm like going through my head. Damn, dude, you're like 30. Uh, anyway, <laughs> no, um, dude, it, it means, it just means that you've had a very active and exciting life. You gotta think of it that way. You've done a lot of cool things. I'm a, thank you, Nate. Thank you. I'm an adventurer as it were. <laughs> yes. Um, but no, yeah. So, I mean, I, again, I, there's, yeah, the few year gap in between, you know, when I started jumping rope again was sort of after teach for America, um, you know, and sort of when I came back to Los Angeles, but again, yeah, I, I was training at barbell basically from the moment I got back from TFA, which I guess would have been 2014, 2015 in that range. Um, but again, didn't start, I guess I really didn't start jumping rope until like 2018 now. So um, why, why did you put weight on during that time period? If you're, if you're okay with sharing that, cause I'm, if oh, it's yeah. cool, cause I, I would like to put some context around that just for, I think, I think a lot of people, I mean, including myself, I've not maintained my peak level fitness all the time. I've definitely had a couple of spots where I've yeah. lost. I currently right now I have very little muscle mass considering where I was six months ago. So I'm curious why, um, why the fluctuation before barbell and, and why you put on more sure. weight? I, I think it's obviously as it usually is, is a number of contributing factors, but, um, some key ones, I, I love to eat food. Uh, and you know, I know people say that because we all love to eat food. I really love food, man. Like I, <laughs> like you are I, legitimate, the epitome of foodster hipster. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, dude, I'm a complete hipster. I, I used to think I wasn't, but when you look at the big beard and the the you know the geolocation and the love of food and, and microbrewery, I guess I'm pretty damn hipster. But um, but have you yes. had the have you had the vegan uh vegan hot wings at I, in L.A.? No, I'm not a vegan. I'm not a vegan. No offense to anyone in the vegan community. I'm I'm certainly more of an omnivore, and uh, you know typically the vegan stuff. I just I find myself going back to the to the meat. But, not um, not gonna lie, dude. I have. I was vegan for a year and, and I went in LA has a couple of notable vegan spots, obviously. Oh, yeah. And I had gone and there is one spot, I forget where it is, but there is one spot that has, um, basically like little chicken wings, but they're vegan. And I'm dude, not even kidding. Huh. They're legitimately really, really tasty. It's not chicken. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a difference in the texture, but the texture still is very good. 
So Listen, man, it's worth I'm checking down. out. But anyway, sorry, you were t- you were talking about how you're a foodster. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So no, I'm just saying, like you know, I have a love of food. You know, I was raised with a love of food. So during that period where there was a lot of weight gain, man, I think it was a combination of <laughs> that love of food and really not not really tracking um, a healthy diet. You know, I wasn't eating McDonald's every day. But, you know, there was a period there where I was eating a lot of fast food. I was eating big quantities of food and I was powerlifting. And I think, you know, I I would try to convince myself that, oh, yeah, with all this this strength training that I was sort of balancing things out. But the reality was, man, you know, as you know, you're not getting into high rep ranges typically with powerlifting. And so I was kind of fooling myself into thinking I'd like earned this food because I was, you know, doing a five by three at a heavy weight, you know, and deadlift for that day. Um, but you know, I, I was still in a better mental state, I think because of the training, you know, I was getting those endorphins from strength training, but I wasn't at all paying attention to diet. I wasn't doing any cardio. Um, and so the, the weight kind of shot up and then, you know, there was a period, uh, a couple of years back where this is before jump rope actually, where I'd actually gotten a somewhat serious injury. You know, it wasn't, um, you know, I, I got a really, really bad lumbar strain doing a heavy deadlift. Go figure. That is, that um, is the, that, those are the worst. Oh yeah, my dude, gosh. it was, it was rough, man. And I was like, oh my gosh, should I just hurt my spine. Um, and I can't exactly give you the, the date when it happened, but I do know it definitely correlates to when I started rethinking my training. So that actually was a pretty, pretty pivotal moment. You know, I, I had this really intense lumbar strain. I sat back and was like, what the hell am I doing? You know, I wasn't, it wasn't like I was training for comps, you know, like a lot of my, um, or meets, like a lot of my, uh, friends at barbell were, you know, I was just kind of messing around with, with powerlifting. So I'm like, okay, I'm going heavy. I'm hurting myself. I'm getting bigger. What am I doing? And then that kind of, I think that was the moment a few years back where, um, I said, maybe I need to rethink my training and kind of develop a new thing. And that's when I sort of started slowly, um, boxing a little bit again. And by that, I mean, hitting the bag, you know, um, I have a friend at the gym who, you know, threw some pads on a couple of times and then I found skipping. And so I, I stopped strict powerlifting and I moved into more of a um, kind of cross training vibe with uh, the emphasis a lot on jump rope and learning that skill. That's really cool. I, I It's cool to hear the pivots and the shifts because I feel like for a lot of folks that are new to fitness or maybe they do mostly jump rope fitness and haven't explored other other ways to work out it can seem very, once you find this thing that works, you just stick with the way it's working and then it's all good. But there's yeah. always a way to recontextualize the same workout. There's always a way to kind of shift and move forward like you did, um, which is really cool. You, you mentioned before too, that the strength community is very connected and is very, uh, also a very wholesome community. Are there similarities between that one, that strength community, between the strength community and the jump rope community? One one thousand percent. Um, and that's, I think why I keep gravitating towards both communities, you know, is uh, I think one of the first shocking things I found out about the powerlifting community or the strength community is that they are just as, if not more nerdy than uh, us in the jump rope community. (laughs) And I say that, and obviously, man, I don't use a nerd as a pejorative term ever. I've been a nerd my whole life and it's, it's definitely a compliment, right? By that, I mean, people, care as you know so passionately that it oozes out of them that's the nerd dumb i'm talking about so like at barbell brigade you have and dude it is so humbling you have athletes who are you know like what feels like a quarter of my body weight lifting triple theirs you know and you have that's insane yeah dude it's like these crazy athletes who are training seriously for meets but they never you know, um, turn away. If you have a question, obviously if someone's in a heated training session, don't bother them, you know, lifting right. four Oh five on your back, you know, it can be scary, but, but they are always welcome for advice and conversation and trading training videos. And, you know, again, the Instagram community is really big for strength as well. Um, and again, there are exceptions, you know, I think we'll find people in, in any area of the fitness community that might not be as warm or welcoming. And I tend to kind of gravitate away from those people. But I think by and large, uh, powerlifting, strongman, jump rope, all these folks who are passionate nerds, they tend to be really cool and kind um, and, and have a desire to impart what they've learned so other people can grow. And that's just, dude, that's so badass. I, I just, 
even talking about this with you makes me feel like, you know, reminds me I'm on the right path with the right people. Um, yeah. but yeah, the, that, that same shared kind of vision of helping each other out, it feels, it feels present across both communities. That's yeah. I literally have nothing to add to that because that's literally a perfect explanation of all that. That's really cool. What, so you, you spent a lot of time, obviously really dialing in your fitness and reworking it to something that is livable long-term where, mm-hmm. where are you at now? I mean, let's, and let's take two versions of now let's take now before quarantine and then now yeah. during quarantine, because I want to talk about your rock throwing because that's really <laughs> cool. But before the rock throwing, where, yeah. where were you at fitness wise? Um, or in terms of where were you at with how you structured your workouts right before quarantine when you were in your groove? Yes, I'm so glad we're talking about this because it makes me more excited to get back to Barbell so I can train again. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, so prior to COVID and all this stuff, all this madness, I was still training at Barbell Brigade. But, you know, over the past few months, i would gotten really passionate about strongman training. Um, and obviously, that's a completely different animal from powerlifting, but still very much uh, revolves around strength, technique. Um, but I have some great friends, you know, Stanley Merkland, he's a head coach. Uh, over Barbell Brigade. Um, my buddy Michael, who's currently uh, active military, he's a strong man. Um, and Brian, another trainer at Barbell, these guys all kind of taught me uh, basic strongman movements. And that's things like farmer's carries uh, and stone lifting, um, yoke walks, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was really, my training split was a lot of that, those strongman implements, but more of the conditioning ones. So I think I was training five days a week, I was jump roping. Every day I was in the gym, whether as a warm up or a cool down, and I would basically switch off, you know, the different strongman implements so I could recover. So I was doing a lot of um, a lot of sled pulls. So you know, I'd I'd yoke up a sled with you know 300 pounds, 400 pounds, and pull it with a rope. You know, I was doing that for uh, sets of you know like 10. You literally just pull the sled across yeah. the turf, push it back. I was doing that quite a bit. Um, then I would do stone lifting two days a week. And that would basically be, uh, you know, if I was, I wouldn't go too heavy because I was terrible at it at the point, but it would, it would be sort of high rep, lower weight stones um, and lifting those for like 10 sets uh, on a pull day, uh, doing some overhead pressing as well. Um, and some, some light dumbbell work. So again, five day training split. I know I'm doing a great job of explaining this. No, no, um, you're good. You're good. <laughs> And then, and like I said, really using jump rope as a way to keep the heart rate up, um, or get it going. So like I would, I would start with always start with at least, you know, 20 to 30 minutes of jump rope. And that would be for me, man, it's typically cause my conditioning isn't as great as some others I'll do, I'll do intervals. So, you know, usually I like 45 second intervals, uh, 30 second intervals of, of, of jump rope kind of sprinting as it were. Um, mm-hmm. and then doing that for a span of, you know, 20 to, to 45 minutes or so, uh, and then getting into the workout, um, after that, that's and a then you, huge warm up. <laughs> well, 45 yeah, yeah, minutes man. is a lot. Well, yeah, yeah. Pro- I mean, it's probably, that would be on like the, the better days, but okay. even if I, if I was doing a longer session at like 45 minutes for a warm up, dude, it would be a lot of resting. So okay. it, I guess I, I don't want to paint the picture that I'm doing like 45 second sprints with like 20 second breaks for an hour. It's really not that. <laughs> Um, I think on an average day, it's, you know, I'll do some intervals. I take a quick break, do some more intervals. And and typically that spans that time, but it's not like I'm going hard for that long, especially for a warm up. Um, and yeah, I don't know if I was clear enough about all that, but I guess, I guess that makes sense. I mean, so what you, you mentioned pull day. So are you structuring your workouts by push and pull? Typically. Yeah. And, and again, that's, um, with the understanding that it's very strongman oriented. So again, for the, the pull day, which I'll probably do twice a week, um, is again, a lot of those sled pulls and, and even there will be some sled pushes in there too, for the conditioning, plus some uh, bent over rows and dumbbell rows, things of that nature, stone lifting. And then the push days, um, are probably going to be more of the, the sled pushing, uh, overhead presses, you know, shoulder presses, lateral raises, um, but yeah, so it's kind of like a push pull split is okay. what it feels like. That's yeah. cool. And then do you, I'm curious when you started to integrate freestyle skills into your, into your workouts. And I'm curious if you've done or ever, if you've ever wanted to do or have done 
um, a session just dedicated to jump rope skills, if that ever happens. Definitely. I feel like I'll find that um, on my off days, especially when I'm not doing any strength related movements, you know, um, I'll, I'll do <laughs> horribly, might I add, try freestyle sort of workouts, right, where I'm really more focused on the skills themselves. I definitely do those, but I feel like I haven't really structured those in, you know, in like a schedule way. I feel like I kind of always set aside a little time when I'm doing more of a fitness uh, jump rope warm up or workout um, where I, I practice some skills, um, if that makes sense, you know. But mm-hmm. I, I do think I really want to like be able to program more of those sessions in. Like, okay, today I'm just going to focus on like a mic, right, or just focus on this or that. I don't feel like I'm as organized with it yet. So has that changed at all considering the quarantine? And and how has your in- so two two part question, how has, you know, your whole workout routine changed during quarantine and has your jump rope changed as well? That's a yeah, it's a great question. I feel like I def- I'm definitely doing a lot more jump rope. So like <laughs> every day I work out, I'm doing a lot of jump rope. Um, but obviously without all the, you know, the equipment of barbell, I've been forced to adapt. So I'm still doing strongman um, in the sense that <laughs> you, you have a giant here. rock. <laughs> I think honestly, it sounds ridiculous, but I I had just moved into a new place, you know, thank heavens before this all went down. I have a yard. I'm very blessed that way. Um, And I'm blessed by there being a big rock that was sitting outside my door. And I said, well, I don't have any Atlas stones, you know, in my yard, but I do have this this big ass rock that's just been (laughs) sitting here. So, you know, when quarantine started, you know, a couple months ago now, what month are we in? Th- month three? Uh, um, dude, I have no idea. Something I'm just, like that. I'm just continuing uh, to post on Instagram and keep going with yep. the days. <laughs> <laughs> so however long we've been in this thing, yeah, you know, I found this big rock lying there at the beginning and I said, boy, that looks awful heavy. I wonder if I could lift it. Um, and that's sort of, uh, I guess that's sort of inspired by the strong man attitude, you know, like there's a big heavy thing that looks like you can't lift it. I'm going to try to do it. So I started, you know, trying to deadlift this big boulder, uh, and lap it, uh, at least at first. And that was a chore, What? but real quick, what is lapping? For oh, sorry. So, yeah. So in, in, you know, the strong man movement, if you're lifting any heavy implement, right, you deadlift it up first. And then, of course, the objective is to eventually, you know, clean it uh, and maybe even press it. But with with these big, awkward objects, typically you can't just, you know, rip the object up and like, you know, hard clean it straight off the ground. Most of the time you have to bring the, the stone or the implement up and then kind of sit it down into your lap. So then you can find a better hold on the object and then try to kind of rip it up towards your chest in the clean gotcha. portion of the movement. So it's really the point of the movement where you're actually like kind of uh, the stone is in your lap and you're closer to the ground and that's where you're finding your hold on it. Um, so I couldn't even lap the stone at first, you know, I, I couldn't even think about cleaning it, but eventually, you know, I sort of structured my training around that. So a few days a week in quarantine, I was really just going outside trying to deadlift this boulder lap it and then eventually clean and press it. Um, and you know, I'm happy to say now it's, I'm to the point where the movement is really not awkward. And, um, so a few days a week I go out there and, and I do quite a few sets of just, just practicing, picking up the boulder, cleaning it, pressing it. Um, I've also used the boulder to squat (laughs) before it's actually, yeah, yeah, it's really awkward. I've only done it a couple of times, but what I'll do is I'll shoulder the stone. So instead of you know, bring it to like a front rack to where you're going to press it. You yeah. sort of clean the stone up and just shift it over onto your, your shoulder and then squat down from there. Obviously that's, that's not as clean as a barbell squat, right? Cause most of the weight's centered on your right shoulder or your left shoulder. Right. But, um, it has even practicing that though has, has forced me to, and I've only done that a few times, mind you, it's just helped me kind of keep the core strength and, and kind of train my legs at the same time. But, um, yeah, so I would say a few days of the week uh, in quarantine, I'm outside lifting that rock, you know, trying to clean and press it um, or press for multiple reps once I get up there. But then really uh, beyond push-ups and, you know, core exercises, um, all body weight stuff, I'm really jumping rope. And so I think, you know, I, I'm doing – it was sort of like my normal – jump rope training. Uh, when I first started, I was, I was pulling out the PVC rope, you know, doing a sort of 
stretched out 40 minute sessions where I was just really trying to um, go for a couple minutes at a time, you know, and then take a rest. Uh, but now, you know, I did get my first beaded rope. Um, I, Chris, you know, I got a rope from him. Um, shout out to him because this thing's really badass. And I've and now I'm finding that I'm trying to build a hybrid of like a fitness style jump rope workout that incorporates freestyle movements. I feel like that's sort of the what I've gravitated to. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting to hear that because I've had that kind of an idea on my mind for a long time now in terms of how do you put together freestyle skills, not not even just jumping, but like actual freestyle skills with a strength movement. And, you know, I've, I've done personally, I've done things like um, like an 80 percent, 80 percent like deadlift um, for for like five reps or so supersetted with like 10 tjs or something and that's super cool it's dude and it's brutal it's brutal because you do because <laughs> yeah. you do these deadlifts and then your your entire your legs are shot and now oh, you're yeah. asking them to do a plyometric movement to get really get up and it i like it for the workout benefit but also it really teaches you to dial in that skill and i'm sure you could actually switch out the tj with even like cross doubles or whatever other multiple fits just to just to focus on not necessarily the best version of that skill but to really refine it you know Um, I like to I like to induce that fatigue state so that you can practice your worst form and make improvements there better but it's cool to hear that you've done that kind of thing because that's I think a really awesome thing that would or it'd be a really cool way to do fitness is to pair actual freestyle skills with that strength stuff. Um, Dude, that's, yeah, that's really, that's really awesome that you bring that up too. Cause I feel like, you know, like you said, I kind of been innately just trying that out, I guess it's, but it's been more of a function of like, I'm going to do, you know, clean and press this rock, but I want to keep my heart rate up and keep moving and stay as athletic as possible. So jump roping in between those sets has kind of been a thing, but you know, having a structured kind of program set up around that could be really fun and really tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, well, I don't know on the strength side. I mean, I'm not super sure. I mean, I don't have a huge background obviously in, in strongman stuff, but like, I really think that you could just take this formula now that we're talking about it. Like what's yes. I'm thinking of all these things that I was, you know, spitballing a year or two years ago. And I think you could take whatever strength movement you want to do and then superset it with whatever freestyle skill you want to do and if if your goal is to get better at freestyle skills which it sounds like for you it is right now to like train those freestyle skills you could pick one that is a medium level definitely not a hard one because a hard skill Mm -hmm. with strength training is a very bad combination but yeah um, like just because i i have been there before and it was a mistake <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> but like you could take even like something like a toad or that cross double or like um swing open doubles back to back and you can just do reps of that not even like you know normal freestyle stuff of like bouncing between different skills and flowing but even just take one skill with the sole intention of like i was just saying refining it because now that you're in this fatigue state that is the perfect time mm. to take away any expectation of completion so the, like you obviously want to complete the skill but like let's remove the requirement to complete it and let's just focus on all right this is literally the hardest case scenario for me to complete this skill let's focus on getting my knee up a little bit higher in the toad let's keep my chest up let's make sure i do xyz things and now you don't have to make every skill it's a bonus if you do but you don't have to make it but you're keeping your heart rate up by attempting it over and over and over, but you're only making one tiny little tweak or, or a couple small form adjustments while you're doing it. So for me, cognitively, I like that focus because now you're, you're not getting into a routine. You're like engaging your mind, but not as much body, but you're still keeping the heart rate up enough. If that makes sense. Oh, dude, a hundred percent. And actually you're keying in on one of the things I really enjoy the most about jump rope is that, you know, I mentioned, oh, you know, I, I want to stay athletic and move. And I think, like I said, that's why I moved away from a strict squat bench deadlift kind of powerlifting style training to more of a strongman um, style that that incorporates a lot of conditioning and athletic movement. Um, 
And with jump rope, dude, you said that that notion of the cognitive stress, which has been so crucial for me too, because I feel like ever since I've started jumping rope, like I'm not lying here, I feel sharper uh, in terms of my movement, right? Because it just it really does. I don't need to explain this to you. Train your brain and yeah. um, you know your coordination. You know, you have this crazy momentum of a rope, and you're trying to focus on on crossing it over and jumping up. It's just this wild tool that that is really kind of sharp in my mind. And to have that paired with something that people think is just this brute, you know, strength, which is not, by the way. Uh, it requires a lot of coordination, but, but, com, you know, the, uh, jump rope is definitely more elegant and requires a lot more finesse sometimes than, than just yoking up a rock. Right. Right. Um, I would argue that if you're doing it effectively, there is a lot of finesse uh, involved in, in lifting something up and pressing over your head, but you know, you can get away with, I think kind of fudging it a little bit. Right. And just like, just ripping that thing off the ground But jump rope, dude, I think a lot of the times it's really less forgiving, man. If your foot placement's off, Bam, whacking the toe. If you know, yeah, if don't come over real. this right, whacking the back of the ear, dude, or the back of the, the Achilles tendon. I've been hit in so many strange places with a jump rope just because if you don't focus, man, it it, it makes you pay. And that's kind of um it keeps you sharp. It makes you think. And I, I really do appreciate that. Not getting whipped, obviously. I don't appreciate that part. That sucks. <laughs> but uh, you know, hey, pay attention more. No, for real. <laughs> no, I got you. It, it's funny you mentioned that. Like this is there are several things with jump rope that like I innately know, but it bugs me so much that I don't have a scientific answer for. And like <laughs> that is one of the things where like I know, I mean, the brain has its kind of two different ways of working, right? There's like this creative side and then there's like this organized discipline side, left brain, right brain. And mm. there's a lot to be said about motor skills and how motor skills with both sides of the body, how those play together. And um, I was speaking with, oh man, it's escaping me. I, I think I was speaking with Adrian Beneggi. And if it's the wrong person, I do apologize. But I think it was Adrian who's... Um, one or both of her parents worked with um, kids that required um, special special teaching because and so, something with the jump rope. I think what she was saying. I I do need to review this, but her parents were using the jump rope as a tool to help the kids cognitively because they needed um, boosted teaching uh, help. And wow. so yeah, and and there there I know like I know for a fact that the jump rope engages the mind, I think, on all fronts. I don't have a scientific explanation for it yet, but I really want to find out. <laughs> Dude, that would not surprise me, though, in the slightest. It would not because, again, like that that um, when I'm like, I guess, I don't know, man, we say freestyle. Obviously, my repertoire of, of movements and tricks is, is you know, it's very uh, beginner for, in my mind, um, you know, but I feel like this, this, the improvisation involved when you're really flowing, you know, I really like that part about jump rope is obviously so creative and it's expressive. And like you said, it's this kind of duality, you know, cause you're also having to force on the more technical side, but I can imagine that, that for some learners, you know, especially a jump rope might really, really benefit them. Um, e even in terms of memorization too, I think there's stuff with jump rope and the kind of beat, uh, and the timing required that it helps with things like, like, you know, memory, um, but again, it, that could it's be very, something. yeah, it's very similar to music in that sense, yeah. you know, because, because the rhythm, the rhythm piece is there and you're, yeah, dude, you are, you're a hundred percent right. But I think an important point too, just to, just to put an asterisk on, like when you, when you say, you know, your freestyle skills, you know, are beginner level, like also it's important for people to know that while there is a massive, massive world of skills that are possible to complete. Mm -hmm. you know, you, your fitness is your fitness and it's your, you have your own goals. And so I just would, I just want to make sure that people don't take like, you know, the way I do freestyle is not the best mm -hmm. or the right way, like the word best and right. And like, there's no valence attribution here. It's really that there's these resources available to every jump roper and the more they're exposed and have context, they can then tailor their workouts as you're doing, you know, and as yeah. you have done and, and as you continue to do with freestyle, like you, it sounds like you continue to be inspired by different skills and find new ways to integrate it into what you're doing. And that's kind of 
the foundation of my philosophy with jumping is not that you have to jump efficiently and not that you have to aspire to be like a competitive jump roper, but that yeah. with, if I give you the foundation of here's, here is efficient jump roping. Here's what these skills do look like. Here's what the things that are possible. You can then cherry pick what you want and apply it in the way that fits you the best. You know, see, and that's why Nate, that's why jump rope community is awesome, and that's why you're awesome because I, I give you one shred of self doubt, and bam, you answer right back. <laughs> like, dude, you're doing awesome. Your style's incredible, and I feel good again. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's, but it's it's important though, and like it yeah. really, and and I know it, it it's it's funny, and but it's also it, it seems so silly to make such a such a fuss about yeah. such a seems like trivial because we're just having this conversation, but there are so many people. The reason why I bring it up and the, the background for me, why it's important is because I see so many folks um, who come to me with questions that because they learned a certain way within a context that did not include all skills or was they learned in a context that was only focused on one style. Mm-hmm. They it's for so many people for the majority of people, they, they do want to learn more than just one small context. But the problem with learning in that small context and then moving out of there into other skills, whether that's competitive or otherwise, you know, it doesn't really, doesn't really matter if they're moving out of that. There are certain principles that are not known that then in, uh, prohibit them from learning new skills um, quickly. And <laughs> when I say quickly, I mean a lot of people have to go back and redo a lot of their fundamentals in terms of side swings. I know I've talked a lot about side swings. I don't hate side swings, but the side swings are one of the biggest um, culprits of misunderstanding and jump rope because a lot of people don't jump on a side swing and you don't have to, but if you don't understand that you're not jumping or that if you don't understand that you're finishing your skills into a swing, when you move into skills like, a toad or, or double under side swings or all these different styles. And you see someone on Instagram and you see their style and you're like, wow, I want to do that. I'm inspired. Yeah. That's cool. And then both sides of that party, once they engage in a conversation, fail to recognize the side swing issue. There's a lot of frustration for that person. And it can, I've seen it really result in a lot of self doubt or like lowering confidence in the skill. When in reality, it falls on the coaches in the community, not on that athlete. And so that that's kind of the reason why I make a big deal out of it is because though it seems so small, it has this really subtle but powerful effect of making it not only more difficult for people, but removing pieces of joy. And I think yeah. a lot of people hear what I, what I coach and what Chris coaches in terms of the discipline side of things and the efficiency, they hear that as a, regimented thing but it's really not it's more of here is you know if you go to gymnastics they don't say throw a backflip they say we're going to work on your hollow position on the ground first then we're going to work on jumping up and tucking then we're going to work on these couple things so that you understand each element of how this works based on physics now it seems like overkill but once you've got that skill locked down and you understand those principles, it applies to so like your hollow position applies to your handstand. And if you can learn how to rotate backwards, yeah. similar things apply to rotating forwards. And, and the same thing applies to jump rope. So it's, it is more effort up front, but then once you've hit that threshold of learning those initial skills and, and techniques and principles, the downhill is so much easier and allows people to just navigate in between different styles you know so now i've really gotten off on a tangent now but that that no, is that, that's dude, why that's this, important this is great too because uh you know it's funny that you bring that up and then i'm sure we can we can move on but i did want to address how i think and this is just to shine some light on you and chris uh both for a moment here because dude that's good coaching i'm sorry like i i think when you know, I remember hearing the side swing piece uh, early on from both of you. And I was like, I, you know, I didn't really understand the initial impetus behind that comment. And I'm like, no, dude, I get it 100 percent. It's it's just it's meeting this, uh, I guess, heading this off at the pass, you know, before someone reaches a certain stage and and then has to break down all the fundamentals again. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it's good coaching, man, because even when, you know, there was a question that 
I think you, we might address at some point or something that you brought up to me about, you know, it was like a trick that clicked. Um, dude, yeah, and it was, those, it. It, it was those triples, man. The, the mm. real, the, the real jump rope trick that clicked for me was the triples that you taught me how to do at that jump rope workshop. I, I think there's been others, you know, like for me, double under crosses were really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was really excited to get that again. I was still pretty big when I learned that trick. So being able to bound up consistently, but the triples, man, you, you at one point were like, yo, bound up higher during your double unders. I was like, okay, you know, like, sure. And then you, know, you obviously realize that that's the fundamental starting point. So you can get enough height, you know, the elevate, then rotate thing you always talk about, man, that's stuck with me big time. Like just that slower bounding uh, on your doubles to kind of train yourself to hit the triple. That for me, man, that clicked so hard at that workshop. And it makes me think of this whole side swing discussion that, you know, the, if you train yourself to do the fundamentals properly, it, it gives you an easier time when you go to the more advanced tricks. Like, dude, literally at that point, I had not hit consistent triple unders ever. And then at the workshop, I think I hit like six or seven. And that was a result, I think, of good coaching of, of you giving that great feedback of like, dude, you just need to focus on bounding up a little more during those double unders. And then when you go for that, you know, third rotation, uh, when you're trying triples, it'll be a lot easier. And it really was, man. It was. Um, so, again, hats off to you and, and folks like you and Chris who kind of <laughs> teach those fundamentals, no matter how, how tough it may be for the athlete, because uh, that was clutch, dude. That was a really exciting time for me. I'm really happy to hear that that stuck, man, because like. I remember watching you and like your, your wrist rotation was totally like you, everything was right. It was just that elevation. It was really fun to watch you lock those down, you know, and especially since I caught it on camera and then was able to put it in the vlog. Like that was, that was sick, but yeah, now but, we can share it with the world and you know, I can go viral Nate and dude, I can talent. I'm we're just, just yeah, dude. Well, you're in the agency, so you know how to run ads. We're going to, we're going to run a few <laughs> ads that say, hi, I'm Dustin. I'm the best and I can do triple unders. And now everyone, I mean, you, you have access to resources. So I would imagine you could get like, you know, most people in the world to see that video, you know, because that's how it works. Right. I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. There's not a hint of sarcasm, by the way, folks uh, <laughs> at home. Um, but yeah, man, seriously, I, I do. I did want to highlight cause that was really exciting. Um, and uh, again, I think it goes back to that learning really core fundamentals and kind of, you know, learning the taking the benefit of coaches like you and learning those secrets ahead of time before it's too late and you mm -hmm. have to kind of go all the way back and kind of retrain your brain you know like for right now dude i'm telling you right now i completely understand the side swing um issue because i deal with that now i'm like oh i get it now i understand what they meant right and now mm -hmm. i'm sort of i'm struggling a little more with um like multiples i guess because i'm, I'm so used to you know, I'm not used to doing that jump, the the jumping during the side swing, you mm -hmm. know, and going into the next double. So um, it's definitely something I take to heart, man. And it's it's really great advice. And and yeah, and the important part of that, too, is like, you know, with the elevate before rotate, which is that's a term from RX Smart Gear, like Dave Newman spent 10 years working on that, which is why that's <laughs> so dialed in is because he put in a lot of effort there. Oh, yeah. Like that. Yeah. But so the thing with like elevate before rotate and with these side swings is that I think so many people get that confused with this is the way to do it always. And that is not the case because you, this is a perfect example right now, taking your side swings as, as a case study, you are now trying to do, I would imagine swing open doubles and swing open, open triples yeah. and like these different multiple under skills that involve swings. But you also, I would imagine are doing your normal flow that does not involve jumping on a side swing because yeah. that's fun for you, you know? <laughs> and this is, this is the scenario where let's really strip it down to just physics and let's take away the context of everything in the sport. If you know how to rotate this apparatus in the air while you're propelling yourself off the ground, you have two forms of exertion. You're, the bound and the rotation of the apparatus. If we remove one of those, we've now taken the effort for all intents and purposes in half, right? We've removed one out of two. You're now doing half the effort. And now all you're doing is rotating the apparatus while you stay stationary on the ground. This is an overly simplified example because obviously it's, it's not, that's not actually how simple it is, but 
for the point of illustrating what we're talking about, when we start with that harder version in quotes, where you're doing both the bound and the movement of the apparatus, that gives you every skill you need to then move forward and to move backwards. So now, but now where you're at right now, you, you practiced just half of that, just the rotating the apparatus. And now you've drilled in that rhythm so much that rhythm piece is huge because now your body has that muscle memory for doing it just that way. So this is a good, I mean, and I, I mean, of course, all of this can be trained. You can, you can always move forward. You're not stuck forever in this way of doing things. It's just that when I've seen this happen hundreds of times, I know that if we make this simple, you know, coaching tip or cue or correction early on, you potentially could have unlocked both at the same time, you know? Yeah. So, but yeah, that's, a, that's a really good point, man. Um, man, there's, this is, this is so good, dude. I'm really glad that we got to chat because this is, this has been really solid. So we went over a lot of your, your, uh, weight loss and a lot of your focus on jump rope. You yeah. know, what are what are you trying to accomplish with jump rope now moving forward? I think right now, you know, we mentioned weight loss again with, with COVID and everything that's going on, you know, and, and sort of my training changing, I have gained a few pounds, you know? So I think there's definitely a big part of me that wants to continue using jump rope as a tool for conditioning and cardio so I can, you know, um, shed some of that added weight. Um, so, so feel for me, definitely, uh, at this point, just given where I'm at, uh, I feel like weight loss is still a primary goal, but, uh, with the stipulation that like, I also want to keep learning more skills and kind of leveling up, um, my skills. Mm -hmm. So I think what's great about that is I can do both simultaneously. It feels, um, but those, I think, you know, if I can see consistent progress with, with the weight loss, you know, especially moving further into quarantine, um, and I see that I'm still progressing in terms of the, the skills I'm learning or maybe uh, making a skill on, you know, my one side a little more proficient than it's been. If I can see those things increasing um, at the same time, that would be really cool. Yeah, there's so many different ways you can go about skill acquisition mm -hmm. and progress, which is really, I think, is very unique with jump rope. But would you... You know, we've we've talked about a lot of these different elements of your weight loss. Would you say kind of the key to losing weight and the key to continuing to lose weight has just been enjoyment of the process? Yeah, big time. Because you know, obviously, there's lots of things that at first weren't really enjoyable. You know, I think when I when I first started my last period of a pretty um, intense weight loss, you know, I'd moved in with a couple of my friends. We were sort of doing a friendly, you know. Um, workout challenge, so to speak, the, the dieting, you know, for me, a lover of food, as we talked about a quote unquote hipster foodie, you know, you really, mm -hmm. I did have to redesign how my eating habits and that wasn't so fun for me to begin with. You know, I was shifting from eating whatever I wanted to sort of an intermittent fasting, low carb diet and training a couple times a day. Um, and that wasn't so fun, but what is fun is, you know, the training for me is fun and, and learning new jump rope skills and exchanging, um, training videos with folks in the community and getting good feedback from everybody. That is all super fun. So yes, I would 100% dedicate, um, you know, that enjoyment, especially with the jump rope and, and all that to making it an easier process for me to lose the weight. How did intermittent fasting and low carb go? Like, were you able to maintain that for, yeah, man, I was for, um, I want to say, between four and five months, I was pretty strict with it. The first, the first, um, four weeks were really abysmal, you know, the yes. energy was low, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I was eating quite a few calories. So, you know, I was eating a lot of fats. I was eating a lot of steak. So I, I assume at some point I was in ketosis, but you know, I never tested myself. I just, I knew that, uh, for me, the breads, um, and the heavy carbs were really a killer for me. So I just, uh, yeah, I tried to focus on just eating healthy proteins and greens, chicken and even steak in there. And, uh, but yeah, man, it was, it was really rough. You know, it's not, 
It's not easy to, you know, eat a couple times a day and not have those high fueled carbs that your body's used to. So, but I want to say though, around, you know, the second month I really got into that, that dieting, um, it felt pretty sustainable, you know, it really did. But at a certain point I just kind of, uh, I got, I think I got a little off track, um, with with COVID and everything, mm-hmm. but at a certain point, I knew that maybe that kind of diet is probably not sustainable for me over a period of multiple years. You know, um, you know, I wanted to gain a little more muscle, and I think it's it, it would be harder for me to do it that way. Uh, but yeah, man, honestly, I, I felt you know I don't want to recommend that it's a path for everybody, but for me, you know, into that second month, um, my energy levels were high. I wasn't I wasn't nauseous, you know, and I started really losing a lot of poundage. Um, and now, even though I've gained back a few pounds, I still feel like with the habits I built, um, diet wise, I'm making overall more healthy choices, even if I am tossing more carbs back into the mix. Um, so it was a good, it was a good reset period. Yeah. I think yeah. it's yeah definitely important to put a little asterisk here that you yeah. know, ni- neither of us are physicians, so we can't recommend <laughs> specific, you know, plans. So anything that we say definitely take with a grain of salt and ask your, your doctor, which sounds like a cop out. It's not a cop out. It's that like literally every person's blood work is so different that we could have, we literally could not have any idea how <laughs> certain foods work with someone else's body. But this is, oh. I'm kind of curious on, on your point of sustainability with, with food, have you transitioned to more of, you know, there's low carb and there's slow carb where you're mm. still taking in carbs, but instead of rice, you're doing lentils instead of bread, mm. you're doing a lot of different, like high carb veggies and like beans and stuff. Like, have you transitioned to that at all? I feel like, you know, in the past few weeks, and this is just cause I have, I, you know, again, I admittedly have kind of fallen off a little bit in terms of my discipline. Perhaps. So have I, dude. <laughs> so, yeah, <have> like, I. <laughs> so, so yeah, with that caveat, um, I feel like you know, the, mainly the carbs I'm eating right now. Yeah. I, I like a lot of fish in my diet. So even when I have sushi, you know, for a treat, um, you know, once a week or whatever, I feel like I'm eating a lot of rice. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, trying to think, I, you know, I haven't really dabbled in like, um, programming out my diet lately, so it's hard to say, but, but I definitely, um, I feel like a majority of like the carbs right now are coming from rice. They aren't coming from breads. You know, I feel like I've really done a good job of, you know, I don't as much as I love sourdough bread, for instance, I don't, I rarely eat sourdough bread now. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, when I do eat veggies, um, I feel like I typically, my greens are coming from things like kale, romaine, lettuce. I'm not eating a lot of broccoli or anything like that. So it's, it's primarily just the rice probably that I'm getting a lot of the carbs from. And then, um, I'm not really tracking the other carbohydrates, so it's hard to say, Mm -hmm. but, uh, so I guess, I guess simple answers. I haven't really made the distinction, but I totally see the, how it might be beneficial to like transition off those like hard carbs or whatever and go for that slow approach. Like you're saying. Yeah. I mean, I felt like I've spent a lot of time training this and practicing this for myself just because of same, same goal. Like I want to figure out what works for me and I find that reducing carbs makes me a terrible human being day to day. <laughs> whereas, <laughs> whereas I found a lot of different, um, foods that are, they still have carbs, but they're low glycemic index where it's not spiking uh. blood sugar where, you know, that bread that you're talking about oh, yeah. very likely is shooting you up real fast. But then something like lentils is still primarily carbs, but it gets released into the bloodstream a lot slower, mm. you know, and which, which helps avoid, you know, getting really jacked up and then crashing in like five minutes, you know? Yeah. 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 I think that's why too, man, even, even know that like, um, if I'm not really shaking up the carb intake, I do feel like for me, the more IF, you know, intermittent and fasting approach has been an easier way for me to mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. take in less calories, you know, yeah. um, as kind of how I look at it. So even right now, if I'm taking in more carbs, I feel like I I tend to do two meals a day. So I feel like even on the whole, again, this is different post COVID because I'm probably taking in a lot more. uh, I know I'm taking in more calories now, even, even by only doing two meals a day, but that has been an effective way for me to kind of just not eat as much throughout the day. Cause typically when I sit down for a meal, I'm probably eating, you know, uh, I'm overshooting on calories for that particular meal. So if I cut one out entirely, um, I find that my energy is fine. For me personally, I I fast between when I go to bed and like lunchtime. So um, 
it's just been it's been a simple way for me personally to to kind of just limit that caloric intake um, without having to mess a lot with the rest of my diet. Mm -hmm. No, I totally agree with that. I find that there's also like a, a weird cognitive benefit as well. Like I find that like if I as soon as dinner's over, whenever that is, I'm done. And then if I wait until like you're saying 10, 11, 12 the next day, just eliminating that option for whatever reason, those last like four to five hours of not eating or we'll call it, you know, fasting, um, I feel very sharp and very focused on whatever needs yeah. to get done. Totally. Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm with that a hundred percent. It also, it feels like I'm really, um, training my discipline too. I mean, I know there's, there's definitely research I've heard and, and read about there's, there's anti-aging properties too. And you know, you refrain from eating and all that good stuff. But just for me, even the, like you said, the basic feeling of, I feel a little bit sharper throughout the day. Cause maybe my body's not so focused on digesting the food I've been grazing on for 12 hours. Yeah, you know? for real. <laughs> you know, it's my body and my mind are focused on other things. So yeah, it's definitely something I want to get more serious about again. And I think, um, uh, on the 27th, I'm actually going to give a shot at a, a meal service um, for the first time. I know it's a little pricier, but I just wanted to try out kind of how that might help my fitness goals. So I'll report back on that. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever done anything like that before. I mean, I usually love cooking, so it's not something I've considered. But just being in, in quarantine and having a lot of work going on, I wanted to give that a shot uh, and see if that can kind of help stabilize the diet a little bit more and um, help me kind of push through the threshold again. So yeah. I'll let you know how that goes for sure. Sweet. Yeah. I've had one of my really close friends has done that for a while and he really enjoyed it. Um, oh. he, he's had a lot of, he really likes it. And I think he's used a couple different services. I think the general feedback has been by and large, really great. Mm -hmm. The only caveat, caveat is sometimes that like the meals can be a little bit on the, the smaller side for him. Yeah. Um, but by and large, it works out for me. Like I haven't personally used it just because like I will, this is probably really not recommended. And I would definitely suggest <laughs> consulting someone who's professional about food before doing this kind of an approach. But like, I will find literally three to four meals and then just eat all like the same thing every day for like two weeks at a time and then switch it up another two weeks later. And it's really weird, but it's like, it's just what for whatever reason for whatever reason the rhythm works really well for me. So Oh, yeah. that's interesting. I actually no, see, but I kind of see the benefit of that too, and that you don't necessarily have to worry about variety. I guess for me, I'm kind of I was uh, similar when I was doing my, you know, my more intense keto kind of IF situation, man. Mm -hmm. It was really just a rotation of like two meals. You know, I was eating a big salad for one of my meals with you know, kale, romaine, and then the other meal was probably straight chicken or beef. And I, yep. I kind of rotate those two. And it, it also it was good in the sense that it removed the any worry about, oh, um, variety of meal. And for me, I, I didn't care too much about that variety. So I see what you're saying. But obviously, again, with the caveat that it's not going to be the same for everybody. So, yeah. And like for me, the biggest frustration when it comes to meal plan has always been. All right, we've got all these variables of things that we could eat. Right. And when you, when you ask the question, well, what should I eat right now or today? When your brain is searching for an answer, there's just so much. And then <laughs> yeah. what I, what I, I think what has naturally happened has been, okay, I need X, Y, Z nutrients. I know things that work for me personally and things that I would like to add to my diet. Okay. Here's the things that I need. What foods give me those? What foods are, um, not too, in one bucket. You know what I mean? Like not just one thing over and over, but like the, when I say I have like a couple yeah. meals repeated, like one of those could be like, you know, breakfast is, you know, two hard boiled eggs or yeah, two hard boiled eggs. And then, um, Greek yogurt plus granola and some peanut butter and blueberries like that, all of that together. There's a lot in that. You know what I mean? But yeah, yeah. even though it's the same thing repeated, I make sure that I have like a nice full thing happening and it's easy for me to go, okay, here's the five things I need to buy from the store. It's in the fridge. It's in this location right here. Pop it out. Here's the process. Like I, it's kind of weird, but I systemize the way I make it too. I'm like, okay, first do this, then scoop these in here, then do this, move forward. You yeah. Know what I mean, which is weird, but it really, <laughs> it like saves me a lot of like mental energy that I can then use later in, in important places. 
Yeah, man, but you say that's weird, though, and I feel like you're being humble here because that's like such a good – I feel like that's such a good way to – to approach food for, especially if you have, you know, fitness goals. So like, I mean, you say weird, I hear, yo, this is awesome. You know, it's like, a <laughs> cool, it is a cool, like, you know, cause that's, I think that's, I've found, and I'm sure, you know, you teach this to your students, you know, in a fitness is like the more you can track and measure, you know, I think the more successful you'll be in the long run. And I found that when I'm not successful, it's when I've sort of stopped even casually kind of measuring or tracking stuff. And that kind of tracking measurement, you know, having that regimented way of doing things, man, it probably really benefits you a lot when it comes to achieving your goals. So you say weird, I hear, you know, awesome, I guess. <laughs> well, <More> at- <laughs> I appreciate that. I think really like the, the, the reason behind that is like for the fitness goals, it's for sure. I mean, it definitely, it definitely helps, but really it's that like uh, personally, there's so many things that are happening there during the day and things that my mind is directed towards mm-hmm. whether that's you know necessary and imposed or just enjoyable and things that I like to explore and creatively think about I don't want to spend time cognitive time thinking about what food to eat because for the major like 80% of the time I really don't care about what's being consumed as long as it's fueling me and I can get through it quickly and get to the other things that are high priority. Now, obviously, sometimes like, yeah, like you go out with friends or like you're just you want to cook a meal because it's been a while and you want to have fun with that, you know, and that's obviously different. But like, by and large, it's just a it's just a priority thing, you know, I feel that that's cool, man. So. Man, this is this is so good. We are going on all sorts of tangents right now. So, you know, do you feel like actually let's go back to your your teaching, Teach for America, because yeah. you have this history of teaching and that seems like it's been relatively foundational. Have you applied that teaching skill to jump rope in any respect? Or would you Ooh. like to? as in as in sharing my knowledge with people from like as a teacher yeah or a coach or in any however i can see some examples of how or potential ways where it wouldn't be as straightforward as just like yeah. coaching but i'm curious if that's ever crept up organically or, or just in your mind you've, you've wanted to do something teaching related with jump rope yeah man i this is a great question and it's it's definitely something that's i feel has happened organically i guess again if I ever sound like I'm being kind of uh, self-conscious about it, I guess it's because like, you know, in my mind, and I know you, you've said this before, you obviously can't compare yourself to everyone else's fitness goals or fitness levels, but I still very much look at the the awesome jump rope you do and Mike and everyone else. And I, I consider I, when I look think of myself and my jump rope knowledge, it feels very pedestrian, you know, so I guess I kind of always feel weird about sharing the knowledge I have. You know, if that makes sense, because uh, it feels like I, I want to point them to you, right? Like I want to say if a friend has asked me, hey, man, I, I want to get into jump roping. I go, yeah, check out Nate's channel. You know what I mean? Um, don't come to me. But uh, I guess, you know, that stuff has cropped up organically. And I do feel, you know, it, it's my responsibility to share what I know, even if it's not uh, what I think of to be a master level. So I have a couple friends, for instance, uh, who live in Baltimore and we all play video games together, you know, and they started noticing my jump rope and um, watching my progression and sort of now out of four of them, all of them actually, uh, as of yesterday, have a jump rope. And and that kind of, I guess you could point at the initial seed being me sharing what I'm doing with them. And we actually have an Instagram thread going now, which is, I feel pretty common in our community too. Um, so I guess in that regard, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm always there to offer my, my friends, you know, support um, and advice on skills. And I feel like folks have, have DM'd me randomly and I'm always there to offer my, my support. Like I said, I feel kind of like I want to direct them to the true masters, but again, just like that the the shared spirit of the strength community and jump rope community i feel like it's it's a responsibility we have to share what we've learned with people um and that again what really struck home when when i had my tfa experience because it's like the whole point what is the whole point of this this life thing you know like if you if you learn something or you create something and you don't share it with the world then you might as well not have created or learned it you know what i mean is this how i've I look at it. So 
Um, I guess this is a very long way of saying I feel strange when people ask me for advice or, or want to put me in that teaching position. But of course, anytime it's come up, I've, I've always shared the knowledge I have. And it feels it feels really good to do that because it's it's the same thing I think you felt right when you showed me that triple under mm -hmm. and like I locked it for the first time. Like, although it might feel awkward for me because I don't consider myself you know, like uh, at the level where I should be teaching, dude. I do, it has happened naturally and I will continue to do it because even if I do feel awkward or I don't want to do it, I have to do it. You know, it's my responsibility. Man, it's really interesting that you bring this up right now because I've had this, I've, I've had this similar conversation with several people over time, uh, uh, several of them very recently before you and I are chatting. And it's just now kind of clicking for me. And I, and it's starting to make a lot more sense and I'm going to, I'm going to diverge for a second and I'm going to wrap back around to yeah. my thoughts on what you articulated in terms of coaching and putting out tutorials when you don't feel like you're in a spot to yet, um, which I disagree with, but I'll, I'm going to get around <laughs> to that just, just, and it'll, it'll make sense in a second. But I'm, I, when I was in school, I took a class called the fusion of innovation which is a marketing course about how ideas spread for all intents and purposes. And it's this, this book that I was sifting through for the course also referenced um, another book called crossing the, the chasm, which if you're familiar with marketing is a very, very popular book um, in this diffusion of innovation course. What we discussed was again, how innovations get spread, but the word innovation is not, Hey, I have this new, you know, hoverboard from back to the future. That's now really popular, like, or the fake hoverboard that came out a few years ago and lit on fire every day. It, we're, what we're talking about is like something as simple as a new, I think the example from the book was a seed that a farmer used that was a successful seed, literally a plant that grew and had very fruitful crops. So you've got these several different tribes or co they call them co cohorts, but I'm going to call them tribes because I think that that makes more sense. So you've got like whatever, five tribes. Within each tribe, there is one person. Let's imagine there's 20 people within each of these five tribes, and there's one person that uh, uses this new seed. Well, that guy goes and tells this other guy from the other tribe, hey, I used this seed. It worked really well. And he's like, sweet. And these two are ahead of the curve, and they're very innovative. All the people around those guys that are the innovative guys then see the results and say, Hey, wait a minute. I like what you're doing here. Let me in on the secret basically. So I've talked before about how I personally think jump rope is like really close and, and running up against the new main it, heading into a form of very mainstream fitness. It's for all intents and purposes. It's still, it's widely known, but not in the correct form of knowing if that makes sense people know of it as a playground activity or like oh yeah you use a leather rope in boxing but there's a lot more depth to it that's not known yet and i felt for years now that we're right on the precipice of it pushing over into this mainstream form and now that you and i are talking and now that you've brought up this idea and i've heard it from other people i'm now realizing that it is the same principle this diffusion of innovation principle of these agents of change within these tribes, within these cohorts that are then spreading it and spreading it. And I think to reference, again, I've talked before about bridging the gap of knowledge. There's these pieces of information that are missing that prevent people from sticking with it long-term. And this makes a lot more sense now to me on my end from viewing jump rope and seeing the growth over years and years and years, I'm now get understanding a lot more why this happens the way it's happening because I've always had this. I've always, I've watched what the, um, I've watched what you've described, which is people get a following and then they're asked to do tutorials. And then I see tutorials being spit out every day, not spit out tutorials being produced every day by lots of different jumpers, regardless of their skill level or their time in the sport. And it's always kind of been an interesting thing for me to watch because on one hand I've thought, you know, but before I was really deep into the community, like two, three, four years ago, um, I would think like, well, yeah, why is this person putting out tutorials? 
there's a lot of things that they don't know and there's a lot of context that they don't have. And what I've come to realize, well, in this moment, obviously the diffusion of innovation idea and how this makes a lot more sense to me, but what I've come to learn over the years in terms of this exact idea that you're articulating about like people are asking you for something and you want to put something out for them because you want to help them, but you don't necessarily, it feels weird and uncomfortable. I've kind of arrived at a point where in my mind, what makes so much sense is to, is to just wrap the whole thing in context. Hey, I'm really glad you want to jump rope. It's really great. You and I are going to have this conversation about why it's so great. Understand that my ability to teach you is, you know, at the level it's at, I can teach you only so far as I have come and there is still so much more to be done and I'm still learning every day. But that being said, I can still teach you all of my thoughts. And I think that that is extraordinarily valuable. I don't think that these, t- these tutorials that come out, they don't have to be perfect tutorials. They don't have to be, you know, I have my own philosophy on how jump rope skills should be taught, but that's my philosophy. And the way I think about it is not the way you think about it is not the way 10 other people think about jump rope. And the way coaching works is that everyone thinks differently. So the way you articulate a subject might be very different than the way I would imagine it, but very effective for someone else. And to me, like I, I have a lot of, um, respect and appreciation for, for you and the way you're articulating, like, Hey, there are other people who know this skill more, but at the same time, you have completed these skills. And I think that you've earned a right to pass along your anecdotal knowledge. Now, if you were to approach it from a perspective of, I am now a jump rope expert and these are the ways to do this, that's when we get into a weird, like I disagree with that completely, you know, yeah. because that that context is so different. And I've seen plenty of people on Instagram who in their bio say that they're jump rope expert and they're certified and this, that, and the other, but the skills that are being presented or discussed is such a, not only a narrow selection of skills, but a very superficial discussion of how to, how to be coached and what, what progression to take. So in that context, that's to me kind of lame because that to me seems very lazy or inauthentic because if you've been in jump rope for five minutes, you should know that there are a lot of skills to explore. And if you don't understand all of them, just don't call yourself an expert and don't say this is the way to do it. You can you can still come across as an as an authority and still come across as providing tremendous value to everyone around you by just saying this is the level I'm at. Here's the context of what's possible. Here's my here let me explain to you where I'm at in my ability to coach you and what you're going to get from me. And now all of a sudden to me that is so positive and leaves so much room for growth. Cause that's what it's about. You know what I mean? Back to the whole conversation about limiting people. If someone says, you know, if someone says they're a jump rope expert, but they only understand a narrow set of skills, um, which it may also just, just cause I'm on the subject, it may not be a malicious intent, by the way, some oh, people yeah. I've seen a lot of people who like legitimately are just unaware, which is totally the case. But, um, you know, in, in that context that, that can limit someone. If they learn from a person who doesn't have full context, who says, this is the way to do it, that can limit them from further progress, you know, versus if you articulate to your friends, Hey, here's where I'm at. There's these other people that know how to do different skills and they have a different way of coaching that, you know, I haven't studied yet, but this is what I know. I think that's fine because you're not saying here's the way to do it. You have to do it this way. Only blah, blah, blah. Like you're just giving, your piece of the pie, you know, and explain that there is still a bunch more pie to go explore and eat since we're talking about good food, you know, <laughs> uh, I didn't want to eat dude. But no, it's, <laughs> no, I'm glad that hearing you articulated that way is, is actually super helpful because you know, there, like you said, there are some people who innately maybe understand that a rising tide raises all boats, you know, or they've been taught. Uh, like I said, I, I feel like I've been very fortunate uh, in my upbringing and my experiences to kind of been imbued with that. Um, but some folks maybe are, have not been so fortunate. And especially with, you know, with social media and the advent of social media, number one, I think we have to acknowledge that without without Instagram and social media, it probably would be a lot harder to build a community um, 
to the degree that it's building now. Dude, it know? was. I, I was on YouTube 10 years yeah. ago and I got I connected with like five or six different competitive jumper jump overs and that was it. That was it until Instagram yeah. came out and then it was a slow build as I've watched this whole thing grow. Yeah, so it, it brings to mind, you know, I'm curious to hear kind of you ruminate on this a little bit. Um, you know, for me, I think it's fine that, you know, maybe maybe someone's entry point to jump rope isn't that so dissimilar from mine and that, you know, you see people doing these extraordinary skills in an Instagram clip. And I think maybe the initial touch point for a lot of folks is, man, that looks cool. I wish I could do that on my Instagram, right? Or I wish I could do that because it looks cool. And then, you know, as you burrow deeper into the into this sport um, and, and jump rope training, you learn that it's much deeper, like you said, you know, and just, you know, obviously, yes, it looks cool and it looks amazing and it's satisfying. But um, once you go deeper into it, you, you learn the true benefits of it. So I guess I'm curious, you know, do you think that just the nature of social media is is problematic and that some, you know, maybe I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this? Like, I'm, I'm wondering, do you think there are drawbacks? And if, if, you know, uh, if there are, what are those drawbacks? Um, because it sounds like maybe some folks, the drawback might be not, you know, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. And if you're not, if you're, if you're, you know, promoting yourself like a jump rope expert and you're not, um, maybe you kind of missed the point, but is that like the, the drawback that you see most often with social media? Are there other ones? I'm just kind of curious. I think by and large, it's primarily positive. Um, case in point being, where we're at right now. There are people who put out information that personally I disagree with and personally um, I think is limiting, but the percentage of like the ratio of not so good information that uh, there's, there's information that's not so good in that it doesn't really help so much. And then there's information that's not so good and prevents. Right. And, and I, I, it's important to separate the two and the prevents people from growing knowledge that, piece uh, compared to all the other positive or neutral stuff that exists i mean to me it's like a 95 5 split you know what i mean or sorry reverse that five percent not good 95 <laughs> positive yeah I, I said that yeah. the wrong way <laughs> but oh, like damn dude I, i'm so glad i'm in this five percent it feels <laughs> like the whole world yeah no i'm with you man I'm with so you. like to me by and large i think it's extraordinarily positive i think the to talk about more like when you're asking, you know, what, what is what is the vulnerability of this medium or of this uh, the platforms and where we're at right now? The reason why the landscape of experts is the way it is right now and the reason why the large accounts are large and the not and the, and the accounts that are valuable but not large are, are that way is that. And you def I know you definitely understand this because you're also in it every day. It comes down to marketing. This is not a function of talent. This is not a function of uh you know what you what you deserve based on you know accolades or or actual accomplishments. It is a function of do you know how to connect in a digital space? And and I would separate how to connect in a digital space versus how to grow. Because as you and I both know, those two are largely different. I've talked with Geraldo about that too. Like there's ways to pay your way to the top and then there's ways to grow authentically. And then there's ways to do both. And I think that that middle ground of, do you know how to not only leverage the tools correctly, but also maintain your authenticity on the way up? That's where it's at. And I, and I, I personally believe those players that figure that out and lock that in are the ones that are going to grow to the top. And I think we're going to see a lot of that. I think the one thing to protect against and the vulnerability that we do have is if somebody with purely financial gains and no interest in the community were to have a disproportionately larger ability to market, yeah, which then started to plant seeds of negativity within the community and removed the benefits that we've talked about before in terms of the kindness and the willingness to share. Like to me, yeah. that's why it's so important to put these tutorials out, to do these things. Like when people ask you for something, like put it out. Like you said, like if you don't, if you have this knowledge and you don't put it out, you might as well not have had the knowledge at all. 
Like, right. I mean, to, to be fair, I mean, that, that can be extreme for someone like in your case, like, you know, you don't have to feel pressured or whatever. People who are being asked for tutorials don't have to feel pressured to put things out. But like, that is the stuff that if we continue to do that, that's how we continue to maintain the way the culture is the same way powerlifting has maintained that for decades. Right. It's the, it's the exact same model of like people keep showing up, they keep being nerds and that's good. You know, the vulnerability is if someone gets so good at marketing that they then have, you know, a control over the thoughts and, and the discussions that are happening in the community. And I think that there are several of us who have been around for a long time that consider ourselves uh, well, this might sound stupid or cocky, but like we consider ourselves kind of protectors or people who are looking over the community because we've been in it so long, you know? And I think that there is some friction between people who know the depths of jump rope, but have not necessarily grown. And the friction between those people and the people who are, are still learning about the depths of jump rope, but have leveraged their platforms to be very, very large. And, yeah. and I think that that to me, that's why it's so important to wrap what you do in these, I, you can call them disclaimers, you can call it context, whatever, of like, Hey, here's where I'm at. Here's what I know. Here's where my limits are, but here's what I can give you where I'm at right now. And to me, that is so authentic. And that is so honestly, that's so easy and truthful and gives you 10 times more credibility than saying you have a firm stance on something, you know? So that's kind of, those are, those are really my two cents on kind of the, the technology and where we're at social media wise. Yeah. I mean, so it sounds like we're you know both in agreement that like the, the benefits of having this reach and this, this connectivity completely outweigh the, the potential drawbacks because like, like you said, you know, in my mind, I guess maybe because I'm so positive about the community, I would find it hard to believe that there's some juggernaut that comes along that completely unravels this shared responsibility, this kindness and, and, um, level of honestly love that's in this, in this community. Mm -hmm. Like it feels unlikely to me, but you're right. Like, you know, it's the weird point where this kind of the pleasure of jump rope and skipping meets capitalism. And, you know, maybe if someone is, abandoning this um communal vibe um or this shared responsibility that we're talking about to solely focus on financial gain yeah that could be pretty pretty traumatic although in my mind dude maybe it's because i'm being overtly positive it just feels like based on the amount of people in this community that care about it and the diversity and honestly the you know folks like yourselves who've been shepherding it for a long time i just i don't see it happening you know i really don't but you're right i guess that could be that could be something that could go down. And I guess we just got to be there to protect it, man. And that's why, like, for me, um, I guess another point is I've always found it. people get weird. You know, there's some people get weird about, like, um, giving credit where credit's due. And that's that's never really, really been my thing. You know, it's kind of I always found that weird, especially on social media. Like, um, you know, I had I think it was Chris, actually, because he's amazingly humble and awesome, as mm -hmm. you know. He, he hit me up one day, dude. I can't remember when it was. And he's like, hey, man, thanks for the tag. I appreciate that. I was like, thanks? What do you mean? Like, I appreciate you saying thank you, bro. But I, I just thank you. You know, right. I'm him <laughs> right. Because you all taught me stuff and you shared that that um, that knowledge and, and helped build the community just like you do. Um, but I guess for for that select 5%, you know, maybe they are weird about that because it's kind of a selfish thing. Um, but for me, I guess it's it's felt like an innate thing to do. Again, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. If you learn something from someone, yeah, you do have an obligation to pass it along and kind of pay it forward. But I guess uh, there is that kind of small, small margin of people who who might not see the benefit there. Um, I, I think, yeah, I mean, in terms of, you know, the, the juggernaut that wipes out the culture, I think in order to wipe out, I mean, that whole discussion, like you're saying, I think it's very, very <laughs> unlikely. Like the percentage, right. I mean, technically there is a chance that it exists, but I think that chance is the smallest it could possibly be because it, because the culture is so firm and because there's so many, there are so many people consistently putting out information and pieces of culture that then exist forever because yeah. that keeps happening over and over and over and it's growing exponentially. 
I, that's why I'm saying like, if someone were to come in and wipe that out, like they would have to like, like they would literally have to be like all of the best marketers together in one person. Like it would, it just isn't nearly impossible. So it's not like a legitimate worry, but in terms of just musing about the question, like, you know, but in terms of what you're saying right now, that, that insecurity or that, the, 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 there, there can be some weird vibes. I've talked with Mike Fry about this a lot and, and I'm not going to speak for Mike because Mike's a different human, but to, the things that I've articulated to him, like I have felt that insecurity in the past of like, well, wait a minute, why are these people growing? And I'm not like it, that, that has been a thing inside of me. I have felt that years and years ago, and it's taken me a while to kind of work through that and arrive at like a, at a point where I don't feel that. And the thing is, the the one thing that I I came to realize is that this is not a zero sum game in terms of giving credit where credit's due. If I say like literally an hour ago, we talked about, you know, the, the bounding and the triples. And I said, well, that comes from Dave Newman from RX, right? He worked 10 years to do that. It, the funny thing about giving credit is that it doesn't diminish your own knowledge. It's just (laughs) sourcing where you're coming from. Right. Exactly. You know, and in, in in any case, I think it might actually give you more credibility to knowing when people see that you've done your research, you've done your homework, you know, the players in the game. So I think when we see that it, one of the funniest things that I've seen and watched over the years is that from, from the business side of things, normally there's competition within business in any industry, right? You, you see that too in your work. Obviously that's why you do what you do. And why businesses do what they do. So the idea there is, well, if customer buys X product, then they're not going to buy Y product, which tends to hold strong in a lot of industries for many reasons. But in jump rope, there's this really funny phenomena, which is if they buy one jump rope, they're likely to buy all the rest of them over time. (laughs) And (laughs) it's really, it's been honestly very strange for me because that has never been my mindset to to buying ropes, but I've watched, I mean, that is literally the case of how it works. So in a sense, that's why to me, if, if there's negativity, it seems so silly because this is not a zero sum game, both for information and for physical product. And by, by teaming up and being friends with other people and, and being part of the community, you actually can both win. That's the way it works right now. You know, oh, yeah. and you, you see that a lot, even with Chris and Geraldo, just tag team yep. some, some ropes. And it's like, well, though, tech, like if you think of a, a, you know, a classic capitalistic model, you would suspect like, okay, well that's, that seems like, you know, they're competitors, but actually not so much, you know, because, because there is that deeply rooted, um, community aspect of things and culture, which you know, again, to the point about like, well, is there a way for this platform of technology to bring down the culture? The fact that those two even did that really, I mean, that is huge. Dude, that was super cool. And I actually immediately thought of that. You know, I, I've, I've seen that too in the, um, on the streetwear side of things, you know, again, I'll bring up Barbell Brigade. Um, they have had a long standing, you know, merch line. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, that's in a big way how they build a community and support, support the business. Um, they did a, a collab with a brand called hate brand, which is another popular strength brand. And you think, Oh wow. You know, is it beneficial for them to do it? Of course it's beneficial, right? Because it's, if let's say again, let's say jump rope disappeared tomorrow, knock on wood, that would be awful or strength, you know, like if the community doesn't exist, then no one who's providing products in that community are going to matter anyway. So mm-hmm. in my mind, I see that collaboration, both of those collaborations as a means of supporting the community at large. If you imbue that community with more love and more content and more, you know, and more, um, I guess more experience, um, then everyone wins, but, um, to, to your point. So it, it was really cool to see that collaboration, man. And I see that continued stuff all the time. I also, you know, on the note of buying more ropes, I mean, I, I think, yeah, once you get your first one, man, you get deeper into the community. It's just, it's downhill from there. I, yeah. I have eight, eight ropes, I think now. Um, yep. Exactly. <laughs> and they exactly. all represent, they all represent a different kind of style and community within the broader jump rope umbrella. So like, you're absolutely right about that, dude. It's like, I see, uh, you know, 
people with weighted ropes from different brands and they get into beaded ropes and it's like, dude, we can all win. We really can. And if, 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 if I've learned anything, it feels like jump rope might just save the planet with what we're talking about. <laughs> you know, if you can learn to support each other, uh, in this community, maybe we can figure it out elsewhere too, is what it feels like to me. It's so funny, man. It's that whole saying of like, you know, rather than focusing on what's different between you and I, can we find one similarity? And yeah. when I started the podcast, in interviewing the the idea of interviewing for me is was largely new, and so the kind of question I was asking myself was like, well, how do I make this good? Like, how do I make this you know obviously not awkward and painful to listen to, but like, how should I approach this? And that was what happened. Is I was like, okay, I need to find the similar the similar pieces between myself and this person that's you know I'm talking to, and just kind of explore that. And I found that to be the case with jump up over time is all the people that I've met. You just, you, there's like these layers of friendship that like, obviously because we're in jump rope, a lot of us become friends very quickly because we share this really strong, you know, one thing in common, but then you slowly start to learn more and more about folks and these friendships really grow, you know, and it's, it's been really cool. And I think, you know, in terms of, I guess, the business stuff we were talking about a second ago, too, I think a lot of I had this note here that I wanted to bring up, too, that when you when you're talking about these powerlifting brands also collaborating, I really feel that a lot of um, ways to grow jump rope and grow the sport and how to act in terms of a business sense, which has really been a strong focus of mine the past couple of years, because to me that 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 is the piece that grows jump rope is can we systemize and turn this into a business not yeah. for financial gain but because a business is inherently a repeated process in a, in a in a in a system that turns over and over and over and if you can do that and spit out a result over and over and over larger and larger and larger that's how you get these large scale results but what i found <laughs> to be the case is like these models can be found in other sports when there, there's, there's a lot of discussions and I, I can't get into all of them right now, but like in terms of some of the competitive organizations, some of, um, you know, brand brands, how brands grow, like a lot of these, these pieces that are about jump rope, but not inherently jump rope in and of itself. Mm -hmm. There are models that can be found in almost every other context. And I think the hardest thing, like the most difficult thing about jumping in terms of the growth of jump rope is actually stripping away the jump rope piece, viewing it as just elements and actions and cause and effect, and then comparing those pieces and cause and effect to other people that have been successful, like in what you just described. We were talking about Geraldo and Chris, and then there's this powerlifting couple brands that works yeah. together. And that, you know, if you take away the names and the products, it's exactly the same thing. And I think that the more we can do that, the more this grows quickly, you know? Oh yeah, dude, I absolutely agree. It's, it's really those like mechanisms you're talking about, like, you know, but that's a part of being a student of like life and experience too, is some people would look at those collaborations and just see them at face value. And it's cool that you're kind of burrowing a little deeper and is how, what is the model? What's the mechanism? How can we retrofit that to suit our community? Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, you're right. I think that that's just a, a cause of you being a great student and kind of, um, I kind of want, you know, to invite others, even myself to, to employ that more often. I feel like mo we're all lifelong learners, whether we want to be or not. But, uh, I think I, I need to focus more on that myself, you know, kind of figure out how can I help support the community more and, and what can I learn from other, other models that'll benefit it. Um, but dude, I think that's a crucial skill for anyone to have at large, you know, like, yeah. that's like a really beautiful thing to be able to do. Well, I appreciate that. And I think that it, <laughs> it comes from just being really frustrated. <laughs> Honestly, I'm like, okay, uh, like I've seen jump rope <laughs> for over 14 years now. Why is it not bigger? <laughs> and it's just like constantly searching and searching and searching, trying to find how to make it bigger, you know? And like there not, and this is not the only way, of course, there's so much work being done uh, by other people, a lot of people in the community. Like there is the business aspect, but there is also the performers and the people that are going out and, and coaching all over the world and the competitive folks who yeah. have also been in it for decades doing their own work. And there is a lot of that. And that is, you know, viewing all of this, it's like, okay, what's being done? What's working? How quickly is it working? What are we not 
addressing, you know, and uh, but also mm. really quick to double back on the ropes thing for a second. <laughs> What's really funny is like, I've gotten feedback that people, like people have asked me like, you know, like when are you bringing out your ropes? And this is, I mean, I, I talked with it on the podcast with Tan, but like even before this years ago, people are always like, well, when are you bringing out your ropes? And it's almost, it's almost like people expect someone who is in the spotlight, <laughs> whatever that is to yeah. produce a rope. So it's like almost like a collectible item. I don't know. It's, it's really funny. Like, like, <laughs> like Jimmy, Jimmy has done this and Jimmy has a lot of purpose yeah. behind what he's doing, you know? And so it's, it's, and so like, Sonny and Jimmy to me are like the ideal case scenario for people who care about something and are now providing something that they, they are, they have been asked for and then are using that to do good in the world. And it's funny that people are now expecting anyone in any form of that spot, like to produce a rope and to sell it so that they can then have that. And it's like, that's why to me, it's so funny if I ever see someone who like that, ze- yeah. that zero sum mentality, I'm like, dude, <laughs> like you just look at what's happening around here, you know? <laughs> I do think that's, I mean, if anything though, and I know you probably approach it this way, it's super complimentary because it's also like, that's just a part of, um, you know, having a, like a core sphere of influence, you know, you've, you, Mm -hmm. you do have this platform and this influence, but dude, that people having that desire, like you said, it does feel like a collectible to some degree, but Mm -hmm. you know, that's because they have this immense respect and excitement around you as a person and a coach. So it is cool, but I think it is funny. You're right. That it's like, there's this expectation, um, based on how everything's going. It's like, dude, when are you releasing the limited KG (laughs) rope? (laughs) That's so funny, dude. Yeah. It's, um, that is funny. I pre- I appreciate that a lot, and it's been yeah, it's been a very interesting thing to experience. But um, I'm I'm curious at this point, like you know, we've gone through so much. Has jump rope taught you anything? I mean, we're obviously talking about a lot of things. That even in this podcast, I'm learning yeah. a couple of very important things. But like, has has jump rope taught you anything throughout your time? You know, doing it. Yeah, man. I mean, I think in addition to the, you know, the macro stuff that we're talking about, that sort of um, you know, the community stuff and learning to be learning to be patient. Actually, that's something we haven't really haven't really discussed. But obviously, that I, you know, when I really first learned patience, that was with Teach for America. You know, I thought what patience was until I had to learn how to teach children. Um, and you really have to develop patience. So I, yeah. I would say all those things. But honestly, man, at the end of the day, I think, and this is similar with other um, elements of my fitness and other types of training I've been doing, is that, um, you know, uh, learning that, and this is probably not revolutionary, but hard work and perseverance, and I guess, yeah, patience to some degree, paying off in the end, um, you know, I guess when I see, this is a good point, when I see you do what you do on Instagram, right, if you're doing um, a combo, right, I know that that's awesome. But what's even more awesome for me is knowing how many hours and days and years you spent, you know, concealing the difficulty of that move in that one clip, right? Like that's the true talent, like you hiding how much work this has taken over the last 10 years, you know, sharing that knowledge. For me, I've learned that, you know, even a simple mic release to to even become proficient with a move like that, it really does take an immense amount of work and repetition, um, And that's something, again, it's not a revolutionary thought, uh, and I hope it doesn't sound cliche, but for me, it really does, you know, when you unlock that move, um, you learn that, like, dude, the the proof is really in the pudding, but all that work uh, really, you know, paid off. Like, that's that's the important part. Um, So I guess for me, it's just to, I've, I've learned to remind myself to be more patient and to, to dedicate myself to the task. And eventually it, you know, pays off with the reward of, you know, success. So yeah, without getting too, too much more into it, I think it's just, it's really maybe honed, I guess, if it hasn't taught me, it's really honed my ability to appreciate, um, you know, what hard work really leads to, or that I can't just snap my fingers and, you know, do a quad, you know, like it really takes work to achieve that point. So I guess that was very roundabout again, but, uh, that's something I definitely want to highlight for sure. Now that's super important. And like, (laughs) It's it's funny because I think an, another piece of that that is largely unspoken but is important to remember that we've talked about we touched on earlier is that you're enjoying the process and like obviously there's days that absolutely are abysmal and suck like that is that is part of the process but by and large 
you're engaged in enjoying that hard work, you know, yeah. you're seeing the results and that's, that's really, really important. That's a, that's a great, yeah, that's a great point. And I think that from, from my own perspective, having watched a lot of jumpers over time and see, seen the growth of so many different folks from different disciplines and, and, and backgrounds, a lot of the skills that people see, some of the ones that they think are very crazy, a lot of them are so much more attainable than they realize. Like, <laughs> like, and it's, it blows my mind because, you know, for example, a lot of beginners will see, um, some skills like the caboose where you cross the rope mm. underneath yeah. your legs behind your knees. And they see that as a very high level skill. But the funny thing is once you've built up to a certain level, that's actually, I mean, that is like one of the most achievable skills. And even the, the mic release is a perfect example of like, it looks mm. crazy but it's actually very, very doable with the right progressions and practice, yeah. you know? So yeah, that is, that is a really good point. That's a really good point, man. Wow. This has been, but, yeah, yeah this has been a mission. No, no, I was just going to say like, yeah. And, and obviously, um, yeah, I do. I want to emphasize the fact that, you know, this stuff is fun and that for me, you know, someone who, who really avoided other forms of cardio, like the plague, you know, um, it's pretty awesome to have a, a piece of equipment that, that really is enjoyable. Um, and, and to kind of, so yeah, I want to emphasize the fact that, man, I do this stuff because I think primarily I really enjoy it and it makes, it makes me feel fulfilled. Um, but yeah, like you said, there are some days where it's abysmal. Anyway, I just wanted to emphasize the fact that I really do enjoy this stuff. And, and I'm, I'm glad there's folks like you in the community that, you know, um, do podcasts and tutorials and host workshops just for the sake of, of supporting the community and, and really asking for nothing else in return. So mm -hmm. thanks, man. I do appreciate yeah. it. No, for sure. It's, it's important, you know, it's important to, I, like you said, to help if you've got the knowledge, why not help someone, you know? Yeah. Um, this is, dude, this has been so good. I think we should kind of come around here to the last, last question of the podcast. Um, no, I'm sure, Cause I'm sure we could keep going for several more hours. Probably, probably. <laughs> um, so, so what is jump rope to you? Jump rope. I, I mean, I, I had a, another answer. I had another answer to this man, but after our conversation, it, it kind of made me shift a little bit. Um, because it's this, I, I realized that jump rope for me is this, I, I gravitated toward it for the same reason I, I, consider barbell brigade or my gym community to be the one of the most important things in my life, right? Is that it is like community sticks out so much like, um, and the fact that we're on this podcast, you know, again, I wanted to say something similar to my last answer, you know, Oh, it's a, a metaphor for my fitness at large and getting better, which it is. Don't get me wrong. But I think for me, the community aspect is super important. You know, like I said, I'm, if I'm that introverted extrovert or vice versa, um, being able to, share this with other people and learn from people who are far more experienced than me. Um, and, and at the same time, achieve my fitness goals, you know, make friends like that's super important, dude. And, uh, and again, as we've said, it feels like jump rope and this community to me are like something that can really help us live better lives as people. Like you can't say that about everything in this world, but for me, it's community dude, for sure. I think just to put it full stop, um, community. Man, yeah, that was a that was a good answer. That was really really solid, man. This has been a this has been a powerhouse of an episode. <laughs> man, a lot of words, a lot of words for sure, but yeah. man, this has been fun. This is this is why I like doing this though is because we come from very different backgrounds within jump rope, but we're both able to meet and have this discussion. You know, you this this is why I talk with everyone in the community is because you don't need to be some phenomenal athlete. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't need to be anything in particular in order to deserve a place, you know, um, at least on this show, because it's like, yeah. the, I mean, dude, like we just had that two hour conversation about some really, really impactful, good stuff. So, and I, and I know a lot of folks that are going to really have enjoyed listening to this whole thing. So Dude, thank you so much for taking the time, man. This has been phenomenal. Yeah, dude. Anytime, man. Like I said, I'm really honored to be um, to be on the podcast, and um, 
obviously here to help with anything you need as both a friend and a fellow jumper dude and like and Sweet. i'm just yeah i'm really happy to to be considered man and um you know thanks for talking with me definitely man all right i will let you get back to your day um but yeah dude thank you so much it's been good all right brother yeah we'll talk soon Hey, before you go, I just wanted to say one last thing. Um, one of my main goals for this podcast is to share the stories you know, of other jumpers and provide a full picture about everything that's possible with a jump rope. The more people that hear this, the better. And it would really help me out if you sent this podcast to somebody you know, whether in real life or digitally on Instagram, Facebook, whatever platform you use. It would mean the world to me. <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> I hope you have a great rest of your day, night, lunch, evening, whatever time it is for you right now. See you later.